salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. This video is about uh, common law and the history thereof. Uh, so common law has been around in some form since at least the, the 9th century AD um, in England, and there are precious few written sources prior to that, such as would exist, would be in uh, Latin or English. Um, so even the, the words England and English only exist from 735 AD, written by Venerable Bede when he wrote, um, uh, I said, an ecclesiastical history of the English people. I hope I've got the title right. So the Angles and Saxons had come over to England in the fifth century AD, and from the Angles, who came from what we now call the Netherlands or Northwest Germany, they gave their name to England and the English, and it only referred to East Anglia, West Anglia, but anyway, I digress. So the Angles and Saxons, their legal traditions helped create uh, common law. Um, so there was also classical uh, learning from the ancient Mediterranean world, which informed uh, English law at this time. The notion of jury trials existed in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, certainly well, like in Athens, where every free man could be there as a juror. But of course, they had a fairly small community. So in the thousands of free men in, in, in Athens, that's why it was, it was practical for every free man to go along. So a trial by jury remains a, an important uh, component of a common law to this day. It's been largely removed from Roman law. So in Anglo-Saxon England, a person caught red-handed was often punished on the spot, uh, which could mean even with death. How would you know they were red-handed? Someone who could just kill so-and-so and say, well, I caught him doing it. Um, so you can see how that was open to abuse. Um, whipping was often used, even mutilation. So, but if there was some doubt as to whether someone had committed a crime, he or she was put on trial, and the jury comprised uh, 12 men, um, and they must know the defendant. The rationale behind that was then they would know whether this person was honest or trustworthy. Um, now, the... The disadvantage of this, of course, is that these people might have a prejudice, either towards or indeed against the defendant. Uh, nowadays, we wouldn't do that at all. The jurors are not allowed to personally know um, the defendant or anyone directly involved in the trial. Um, so the jury would hear the evidence vote guilty or not guilty. And for a guilty verdict, there had to be a unanimous vote. All 12 had to vote guilty for the verdict to be guilty. If 11 voted guilty and one voted not guilty, then the verdict was not guilty. Remember, obviously, no DNA, not till like the 1950s, no fingerprints till the 1890s. You could have eyewitness statements, you could have almost nothing in terms of forensics apart from that, unless you're caught with the stolen goods, things of that nature. Often they use trials by ordeal. Uh, a defendant forced to pick up a stone, to be in boiling water, and carry it three paces, then drop it. The wound's bandaged, and after three days, the bandage is taken off. And uh, if the wounds had healed, then the person was innocent because God had intervened. If they hadn't healed, the person was guilty because God, God was signaling that. Um, anyway, obviously it was daft, completely irrational, but it wasn't a very rational era. It was a very spiritual era. So the Anglo-Saxon uh, kings of England uh, said that people had some rights and the kings were under an obligation to rule people fairly and within the law. Now, obviously, what counted as fairly was very difficult at the time. There were thralls, or indeed slaves, so people were treated as chattel. Um, so the kings had to defend the independent status of the Catholic Church, obviously England being a Roman Catholic country at the time. I say Roman Catholic, actually, the church, Eastern and Western, was united, but that's by the by. Um, so the king was not permitted to tax people without the consent of the Wittnagemot, as in wise meeting was the precursor of Parliament. Despite the notion that people had slaves, was also people had rights, as I say, we, there were slaves and women had very few rights, things like that. So society had stratified inequality built into it. Noblemen called thanes had uh, greater rights than, than others. So this notion of uh, inegalitarianism was upheld as being morally sacrosanct by the clerical authorities and the higher ranks of the clergy, or the bishops and the archbishops, were almost invariably drawn from the baronial class. In 1066, England was conquered by William, the Duke of Normandy. William the Bastard, they called him. And not just because of his uh, lineage, he really earned the title. Well, I jest, of course. 
They called him that because he's born outside of matrimony, but he really was a horrifically cruel monarch, as indeed he supposedly admitted in his dying confession. He later conquered some of Wales too. So William the Conqueror, crowned on Christmas Day 1066, um, and had some of his troops slaughter some of the crowd there and then, which more or less set the tone for the rest of his reign. Not only had he won, well, won, won the throne through conquest, but he started killing people on his coronation day. Now, he took some Roman law traditions with him from the continent. Um, and at his coronation, he swore to uphold the traditions of English common law. In fact, he did very little to honour that vow. More honoured in the breach than in the observance, as the Bard of Avon may have said. The Wittnagamot, or Parliament, stopped meeting forthwith. So at that time, most people were serfs. Um, serf is derived from the Latin servus, as in slave. Now, they weren't quite chattel, uh, because they were attached to the land, not physically, but they had a right to stay in the home village, they had a right to family life. Families couldn't be split up, people couldn't be sent hither or thither. So these people um, were renting land off a landlord. They, apart from that, they had to do some unpaid work, one or two days a week, on the landlord's personal fiefdom. And they had to do unpaid things or, uh, like la corvée, which is road work, things like that. If they wanted to mill their corn, they had to do it only in the landlord's mill and pay over the odds. So it's a very exploitative system. So the upper class was ripping off the uh, proletarians, or, well, peasants, I suppose I should say, at every level, the villains. But villain wasn't pejorative at that time. It just meant an ordinary tenant farmer. Uh, they had to obtain permission to wed or to enter holy orders, that's to become a priest, monk, and nun. These might be withheld unless more money was paid, so they were getting ripped off all over the place. So in the 12th century, English and Welsh people began to settle in Ireland, and they brought English common law to us. But of course, their law only applied on the East Coast, where the English and Welsh predominated. Over, over time, they diffused through the whole of Ireland. In Ireland, we had Brehond law at that time. Um, in the Middle Ages, there were separate ecclesiastical courts for the clergy and the religious. That's priests, monks and nuns. So the thing is, who was a clergyman? Well, it wasn't the narrow definition I just gave. Um, really, uh, anybody who worked for the church in any capacity seemed to be able to claim benefit of clergy, as in the right to be tried in an ecclesiastical court, which would give slap on the wrist punishments, even for severe offences. So for an ordinary sentence, such as, sorry, a crime such as theft or battery, the um, king's courts would issue a uh, punishment that would have satisfied Draco of Athens, whereas the ecclesiastical courts would give a risibly mild punishment. The piano might be something like saying prayers or a discalced pilgrimage. Um, many defendants opted to be tried before ecclesiastical courts if they had the chance, because they knew they'd get a very light sentence. So the angel of mercy was very active at the time, and this was an era when um, the death penalty was used very promiscuously. Pickpockets also having their fingers cut off, anyone caught uh, poaching the king's deer, having his eyes put out or indeed being castrated, um, and grand larceny punished with death. So these were very barbaric times. Life was cheap. But the ecclesiastical courts would only come down like a ton of bricks on crimes which were specifically religious, as in blasphemy, apostasy, sometimes simony. Um, to take the Lord's name in vain was of grave crime, false prayer, that is mocking Christianity. Um, to profess one's disbelief in uh, Christianity was to lay oneself open to the supreme sanction. Sacrilege was severely penalised. And that meant um, profaning the mass, um, taking the Lord's name in vain, things of that nature. So universities were ecclesiastical institutions. There were only two of them in England at the time. It was briefly Northampton, I think. And universities were therefore semi-independent of the state, and they had royal charters recognising this. So Oxford and Cambridge had their own police forces, their own courts and so on, um, and these were going in some form until the year 2000. Undergraduates and dons who transgressed the law were arrested by the university police, um, put on trial in those courts and punished, even held in prisons. And they even had the death penalty, but that wasn't used since, I don't think, since the very early 19th century. Um, so universities not only had jurisdiction over the undergraduates and the academics, but over people in the town, because the university owned the city. When I say town, 
okay, Oxford didn't have a cathedral till 1530, so you'd have to call it a town. Likewise, Cambridge still doesn't have one, so town. All right, they say town um, uh, versus gown, uh, like in the boxing match. The gown meaning the university because people wear gowns when they're undergraduates or already wear their dons. A don is a lecturer or a professor. We didn't use the word professor in uh, British English until right at the end of the 18th century. We got it from Germany. Um, anyway, the system was abolished piecemeal, as I said, in relation to the universities. Uh, so along came Henry II, who inherited the throne in uh, 1135. And he decided he must rationalise this system. He said it is preposterous that we have these two parallel legal systems. As somebody's convicted of this crime in the uh, king's courts and he attracts a severe punishment. But if a person were to commit the very same offence and be tried before an ecclesiastical court, this church court would hand down a ridiculously lenient sentence. So we've got to take um, the laity out of the purview of the church courts, the laity being non-religious people. Even Henry II didn't say that priests, monks and nuns couldn't be tried by ecclesiastical courts. He said those who, who can read claim to be clergy, those who make tables or something or candlesticks or is a whatever that sweeps up the church on quite spurious grounds, someone would claim to be clergy, a large percentage of the population. When I say large, let's say it was 10% or something. Um, so I'm reverend to clergy, therefore you cannot, uh, you cannot try before a royal court. So, um, uh, Henry II tried and failed to reform the system. I won't go into it. It's murder in the cathedral. Read your T.S. Eliot. It's Thomas Beckett and all that. Um, so, uh, church courts still exist in some wise, but they are uh, they, they have, they're not the law of the land. They are not recognised by the real courts. Um, and they can only unfrock clergy and deal with... They're like disciplinary panels for clergy these days. And they can't um, incarcerate anyone. So a bit more about Norman rule and Magna Carta. So uh, there was King John, very unpopular king from 11, uh, 1999. And the country was not financially solvent because of the very high taxes to fight the Crusades, to fight the war against France. Anyway, a massive baronial rebellion uh, obliged him to sign Magna Carta in June 1219. Go and see Runnymede, that meadow by the Thames, where he placed his X, led to this misconception that he was unable to write his name, but that's not true. Uh, and by the way, it wasn't an island on which it was signed. Again, that's an urban myth. Some Victorian chap, he bought a stretch of the riverbank there, he cut a channel around it, so a little bit of the river flowed around, and he put it about that Magna Carta was signed at this island. If you want to come, you've got to pay to come into my island. I don't know why he needed to turn it into an island. Couldn't he say, well, it's on my little bit of land? Just go through the gate. But anyway, um, so bad King John, as he's known, had resorted to uh, really dirty means of extracting filthy lucre from people, such as taking their sons hostage and saying, you stump up the cash or he gets made a head shorter. The revolt was really about the barons and not the common people, because most people were serfs, were illiterate, didn't think they had any rights, were not politically sophisticated. I suppose this exploitation was was the norm for the great majority of people who were struggling to get by and had scarcely a morsel to spare. So barons were incensed about uh, is it excessive taxation. It always comes down to money, doesn't it? Um, and then um, in lieu of military service, one could pay scootage, shield money, as in scutum is shield in Latin. So they didn't like that, the excessive scootage that to pay, or if your father died, to inherit that property, one had to pay a hefty property tax, charging them relief, as it was called, to inherit. People put on trial, delaying or denying justice and all that kind of thing, finding people to their utter ruination. So finding any spurious excuse to extort money from people. Anyway, King John was obliged to agree he wouldn't do any of this stuff. So it restated exit rights that were already held to exist, created a few new ones. It's nothing to do with democracy. It doesn't use the word democracy or democratic. That Greek word was forgotten. What a drollery. Um, or freedom of expression. Okay, it is about habeas corpus. Do you have a body in Latin? As in, you can't imprison people without just cause. Um, it applied almost to, to only to free men, and most men were not free. So signed by various barons, clergy, including the Archbishop of Dublin, which is why it applies to Ireland right from that moment. 
So Magna Carta, it's set, um, the amount of scutage could be charged. Note is called Magna Carta, not the Magna Carta, because the definite article is already there in the Latin. So the king could not prevent people inheriting their patrimony. He would no longer um, kidnap people and hold them as hostages. No, no longer delaying and denying justice. Justice delayed is justice is denied, is a well-known uh, legal maxim. Um, so as soon as, as, as King John could, he repudiated Magna Carta. Now the Archbishop of Canterbury had persuaded him to do it, trying to prevent bloodshed, and the Pope came in completely on the side of, of, of King John, said, oh well, he only did this under duress, this document is a nullity. So the, the Catholic Church, or the Church, the only church in Western Europe, was trying to deny people their rights. Anyway, one year later, uh, it all came out in the wash, as in King John died in the wash, you know, in Eastern England. But anyway, Magna Carta didn't die with him. So Magna Carta was not a trailblazer. Hungary had the Golden Bull in the year 1000, signed by King Saint Stephen, about their rights. Bull not meaning the animal, or it is bull, or indeed bulletin. These are common misconceptions. Is because it was sealed in letters in bulla, in Latin, like the Pope used to issue proclamations called a papal bull. Um, so uh, King John's uh, young son, the boy King Henry III, he reissued Magna Carta. It's only about 50 years after Magna Carta, 1265, that Parliament began meeting again regularly, two nights for each shire and two burgers from each borough. A burger not being one you eat, but as in a town councillor, usually prosperous merchants. Um, so nothing about freedom of the press. Well, there was no press. Even uh, uh, books were handwritten. Um, so that was that. The Catholic Church was guaranteed its independence from the crown because not King John so much, or they had been in, under an interdict about 10 years earlier when he'd fallen out of the Catholic Church. Certain other monarchs had tried to suborn the church to misappropriate ecclesiastical property for their personal gain, and there was a lot more of that later. But anyway, that's the significance of Magna Carta in the development of English law.